Welcome to the download, coming to you live from the Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen studio, right here in the Archdiocese of Detroit. Uh, both Christine and Michael are away today, so once again we're joined by a couple of lads from the news team, Trey and Stephen. Thank you so much. You will recognize them, I'm sure, because they're often on the panel. And today it is Free Friday, and for our Free Friday we are not, repeat not, talking about the latest episode of The One True Faith. A shocker. What in fact we are talking about is we are talking about the sacred Heart today, of course, is the Feast of the Sacred Heart. We're talking about the heart of Jesus Christ, which brims over with love and mercy for men. Now, obviously, you know, the pure scientist in me sits there and says, well, the heart is just for pumping blood around your body. But of course, it was Jesus's body and Jesus's blood that actually saved us from hell. So it is most appropriate to think of Jesus's heart specifically within that sense of emotion, within that sense of mercy, within that sense of love. So today, Stephen is going to be talking about what the Sacred Heart devotion is. Trey is going to be talking about the litany of the Sacred Heart, a wonderful prayer, and also how you can have the Sacred Heart enthroned in your home or place of work. Uh, but Brad, let's start off with you. St. Margaret Mary, uh, she introduced the Sacred Heart to the world. Well, she did. She actually spread the devotion. It was already a, a thing uh, with St. John Eudes prior to that for about 30, 40 years, uh, the merciful uh, heart of Jesus and Mary. But the, uh, the devotion, she was chosen as a specific soul to spread that devotion, just like St. Faustina was spreading the divine mercy. And like uh, 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 St. Faustina, there was a bit of uh, tivite with the world. She was, uh, St. Margaret Mary was actually 24 years old before she went into the convent. And there was a little bit of time in there when by the time she was um, 20, she was already receiving revelations from our Lord. Kind of like St. Faustina, you know, what are you doing? Why are you waiting? You know, give me your heart and this type of thing. Her parents, of course, were very poor. She lost her father at an early age. She was bedridden for a period of time. She had professed chastity and, and vowed to uh, jo join our Lord. But she had put that off for a while. Her mom didn't want it, of course, uh, and uh, with her father dying. And her brothers wanted to entice her to go out into the world and to vite around a lot. But, and, and Grace won out. She joined the convent. And within two years, uh, she started receiving actual revelations of our Lord's Sacred Heart. And basically, uh, she was chosen to uh, bring this devotion to the world, uh, the, the, five, the nine first Fridays, adoration of the Holy uh, Blessed Sacrament. She'd always been devoted to the Eucharist very deeply and, and uh, that. But as fate would have it, the, her superiors didn't appreciate this, theologians didn't believe it, uh, her own sisters uh, in the convent would you know, kind of shunned her and all this, so that's all par for the course. Uh, they were, she was blessed with a great uh, spiritual director, of course, blessed uh, 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 Claude uh, Colombier. And he was a good a Jesuit, you know, what he, who would have thought that <laughs> <laughs> there is such a thing as a Catholic Jesuit. But he knew about this type of thing, I'm sure, from St. John Hughes in France already, understood the theological grounding of it, discerned that what she was going through was actually of God and said this is genuine. It still took several years before they started to be celebrated privately in their own convent. She got a superior that was in favor of her, understood these things. And uh, finally she died, I think it was, uh, what year, 1690, she died. Uh, and then it was uh, Clement XIII, I believe it was, uh, 75 years after her death, finally made it a universal, a universal devotion. devotion to uh, the sacred but she heart. was really, uh, yeah, just a chosen soul to, to bring that to the world, and it, it happened. Yeah, no, that's abs it's absolutely wonderful, it's, uh, and it's a lovely devotion. Stephen, explain it. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, uh, first off, recently I was on uh, Census Fidelium's YouTube site, and I came across a, a, a fantastic two-part talk called What Mary Wants From You. And the, uh, the author, a missionary sister, she pointed out really quite beautifully, uh, tragically, but beautifully as well, that, that Christ suffers. He's, he, 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 she reinforced that fact. He's suffering even now. And of course, our Lord is, is uh, beyond time. Uh, he's, he's really in an ever-present now. But she, she reflected on the fact that he, he sees Adam and Eve, for example, surrendering to the serpent right now. You know, he, he sees Judas approaching with his traitorous kiss right now. And he sees uh, each one of us, all of us, you know, with our, our uh, last uncharitable thought or, or uh, uh, unkind word, 
uh, right now, and, and that causes him pain. It, it makes him suffer. And, and, and among uh, the greatest sorrows that, that, that we cause him is, is basically our, our apathy towards his love for us. And this really is what uh, his revelations to St. Margaret Mary are all about. Um, in his messages to her, he emphasized his love for us and also his woundedness at our indifference uh, for, toward that love. And our, our, of course, our, loved, uh, our Lord desires to be known and loved by everyone. He longs to, to reign in every human heart, and, and for this, he asks for devotion to his Sacred Heart, which uh, embodies his infinite love for us. And devotion to the Sacred Heart entails three core practices. There are, there are uh, many others, and I think Trey's going to get into uh, some of that in a little bit here. But, but for, uh, first, uh, he asks us to participate in a weekly holy hour of reparation uh, uh, before our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament. And number two, we're to perform the monthly First Friday's devotion, re receiving Holy Communion worthily on the First Friday of the month for nine consecutive months. And we're also called to observe the annual Feast of the Sacred Heart today uh, uh, by going to Mass and receiving the Eucharist worthily. Now, in each of these, we're called to approach God with the intention of making reparation for our own neglect, our own indifference and ingratitude toward Jesus, but also uh, that of others. And he said uh, in his revelations to St. Mark, Mary, Christ promised the following for those who practice devotion to his heart. He says, I will give them all the graces necessary in their state of life. I will give peace in their families and will unite families that are divided. He said, I will console them in all their troubles. I will be their refuge during life and above all in death. I will bestow the blessings of heaven on all their enterprises. Sinners shall find in my heart the source and infinite love or in an infinite ocean of mercy. Tepid souls shall become fervent. Fervent souls shall rise quickly to great perfection. He said, I will bless those places wherein the image of my heart shall be exposed and honored and will imprint my love on the hearts of those who would wear this image on their person. I will also destroy in them all disordered movements. He added, I will give to my priests who are animated by a tender devotion to my sacred heart the gift of touching the most hardened hearts. Those who promote this devotion shall have their names written in my heart, never to be effaced. That's beautiful. And he also said, I promise you in the excessive mercy of my heart that my all-powerful love will grant to all those who communicate on the first Friday in nine consecutive months the grace of final penitence. They will not die in my disgrace, nor without receiving their sacraments. My divine heart shall be their safe refuge in this last moment. How, I mean, that's obviously the most important thing. It's vital. <laughs> uh, how amazing is that? So, so the purpose of this devotion really is to love Jesus more and more, also to share in his grief for those who reject his love, and to make reparation for the insults that he suffers. So love, grief, reparation, the core of the devotion to the Yeah, the core heart. of the devotion. All of these things about, you know, this, this notion of, of the heart, as we have, you know, sort of in the popular sense of the heart as the seat of emotion, the heart as the place that is where love comes from, the heart that is broken by right. you know, some horrible or tragic or cruel action and so forth. And no, it really is. It really is a very, very beautiful uh, devotion. Obviously, we've discussed the, uh, the, the the first Friday's devotion there, Trey. But there's also a wonderful prayer, and you can have the heart enthroned uh, in a place. Absolutely. So the there's different sets of ends to the Sacred Heart devotion. There are what's called the immediate ends, and there are the ultimate ends. And the ultimate ends, the, the, the concept of the enthronement of the Sacred Heart is about Christ reigning, the Sacred Heart of Jesus reigning within family life, which is the beginning of, it's the most, the, it's the nuclear level of the reign of Christ the King on, it starts with the family, extends out to the community, extends out to the state, extends out to the nation, the church, etc. The enthronement and the recognition of Christ's reign within family life, within the domestic church, is the beginning of the restoration of, uh, of civil society, of Western, of, of Western civilization, mm -hmm. which we see collapsing all around us. Enthronement of the Sacred Heart was promoted largely by a Father Matteo, uh, who was uh, charged with by uh, St. Pius X. With, uh, he lived up until uh, the reign of uh, Pope St. Pope St. John XXIII, and he, We'll get back to enthronement in a second. He was the he was the great apostle of the enthronement. He wrote a book called uh, Jesus King of Love, and talked about uh, he talked about there was a uh, a wonderful uh, quote from him where he said this: All of us have some sorrow, some bit of the cross offered us by Christ. 
This must be put to use, not merely to be endured, and not merely to be suffered for one's own sake, but to be suffered as a sacrifice for the conversion of some soul. Is there a sinner to be converted, a fallen, a fallen away Catholic to be returned to the fold, an unbeliever to be made a Christian? This, the conversion is guaranteed if only sufficient ransom is paid. That's each of us making our sacrifices, making our reparation, and uh, fostering that, again, those immediate ends of the Sacred Heart, which we want to take a look at here. So if you have, you have the ends of the Sacred Heart devotion, these were talked about by uh, another Jesuit, uh, Father Louis uh, Verheluzen, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, Look at those first four ends. He wished us to return love for his love, to make reparation to his heart for the neglect of his love, to pay honor to his heart, and to place our trust in his heart. That's the beginning of fostering that devotion, fostering that, uh, uh, the, you know, being brought to the burning furnace of charity, to, have, to make our own hearts, make our hearts like unto thine. Well, what is, what, is, what is thine heart like? It's a burning furnace of charity. We want to draw closer and closer. And then you have those ultimate ends, to love his heavenly father more and more, to work to establish and extend the reign of his heart. That's so important. We're, we're, so, we're living in the results, in the midst of all of the Freemasonic, uh, false enlightenment, false equality, uh, false rationalism uh, 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 principles uh, that result in, that have resulted, that have blossomed into communism and blossomed into abortion and contraception, everything around us. Uh, complete neglect, complete um, disregard for Christ and his church and his law, hatred of God's law, and finally to afford him the occasion of pouring forth upon men the treasures of his heart, which we talked about before, Stephen, the, the promises. Imagine how different the world would be if those, if those 12 promises of the sacred heart uh, were, you know, the more widespread they are, we're really, that's getting on track to getting out of the mess that we're in. But the, so, looking at those immediate ends of fostering that love, one of, we pray two litanies every day in our chapel, and, and there's, there's all kinds of litanies. There's a litany of the Passion, litany of the Sacred Heart, litany of Our Lady, and so forth. But let's take a look at the litany of the Passion. And, you know, a litany is something, you can blast through it, if you, if, you know, and again, one of those promises of the Sacred Heart is, I will make tepid souls fervent. You don't want to blast through a litany. Um, a litany is really, you can stop and chew on each and every one of these lines, and each of these lines would end with, uh, heart of Jesus, son of the eternal, have mercy on me. Each of these is invoking God's mercy, and each one of them is, it's not, notice it's not sacred heart, house of God, nothing wrong with that, but th there's, there's an intentionality to the heart of Jesus, the holy name, the, the, inculcating of the, of the uh, reverence and respect for God's name. But if you look at those first three lines, Son of the Eternal Father, formed by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mother, substantially united to the Word of God, you have the foundation of our faith right there. The, the Blessed Trinity, the, uh, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, incarnating out of what? Out of the burning charity of, of, of his heart, the absolute, uh, uh, you know, um, the, just the absolute drive to, to create us out of nothing, out of love, to love us into existence, and then to incarnate as, as a human being, to suffer as, as, a, as a love offering to, to the Father, an offering of reparation for, uh, for the, the sins of mankind to the Father, of infinite majesty. Infinite majesty, we're, we're the, so these, these go on and on, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna stay on each one of these lines, uh, but just to, to quickly go through, uh, infinite majesty, became that tiny white host. And that's just something to sit and look at that host and you could think about forever. The sacred temple of God, house of God and gate of heaven. Uh, going on through the, through the litany, uh, there's, there's more, there are more of these lines. Uh, the burning furnace of charity, like what we mentioned before. And the abyss of all virtues. Is there any virtue? What's your predominant fault? Is there any virtue? Uh, we know that most of all, the, the virtue of humility is the, it's like the, the chain and the beads of the rosary. It holds all the other virtues together. The heart of Jesus is the most humble of all hearts, meek and humble of heart, and it holds all the other virtues. That's why it's the abyss of all virtues, most worthy of all praise, king and center. Uh, again, so you, there's that, that concept of the social kingship of Jesus Christ. It is in the immediate, it is in the individual, but it also extends out to the civil society which owes God worship. In whom dwells the fullness of divinity. Again, going back to the foundation of our faith, the burning furnace of charity drove the second person of the Blessed Trinity to, to incarnate as a human being. 
desire of the everlasting hills, patient and most merciful. There's no read. There's no need to uh, despair of of our salvation. We have that that theological virtue of hope there, the fountain of life and holiness. I mean, just imagine if uh, you know you're. It's it's a source of something. It's not just a container of uh, that has all. Of, it is that, but no more than that. It's if you just picture a fountain. A fountain is a source. It's 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 gushing forth with more and more of of what is really our one and last end, loaded down with opprobrium, loaded down with all of our hatred and all of our, uh, all of our disregard and, and, and uh, disrespect, but out of love. Let's, let's continue through the rest of them. Bruised for our offenses, you know, the Isaiah 53, the, uh, it was by, by, our, by his stripes we are healed. Obedient unto death, uh, you know, not, not going, your, going your own, uh, d- deciding that you have uh, the right to uh, take things into your own hands. We, we had a webinar about that a week and a half ago. Uh, our peace and reconciliation is the end of the the uh, the end the end of the when you go to confession and you know the the priest will often say, "Go in peace, your sins are forgiven." Sacrament of reconciliation. Uh, we're supposed to have we we have that peace that we're not. It's it's opposed to that sense of um, that sense of. Uh, scrupulosity and uh, well, you know, all my confessions are invalid or anything like that. Anyone who suffers with that, you, that that's you go to the Sacred Heart, and that's that's also the uh, that's also the source of, of, of peace. Like we're saying, the salvation of those who trust in Thee, and the hope of those who die in Thee. What does it mean to die in Thee? Complete the uh, live a life devoted to the Sacred Heart, and you will die in Him. You will you will die at, in reconciliation with Him, and delight of all the saints. The delight of the saints is not anything of the world. The delight of the saints is the sacred heart. And so the, you, you serve those immediate, those immediate ends, and then going on to the enthronement. The enthronement is the, uh, going back to Father Matteo, uh, he promoted the devotion of enthroning our Lord in the home, in the domestic church. Uh, we see here an example of an enthronement of a image of our Lord's sacred heart in, in a prominent place in the home, and what that says to anybody who comes in is that Christ is king of the of the domestic church. He's the king of the most molecular, foundational unit of society, and that extends out to being uh, the king of the civil society at large. And when you enthrone, there's there's a, there's an, you, anybody can Google and find out about the. Um, uh, various practices. The, the, there's a ceremony and prayers leading up to enthronement. You uh, talk to a priest at your parish. You have a solid priest and knows about the stuff. He can uh, assist any family with enthroning uh, our Lord in their home. And then there, uh, there are suggested devotional practices for enthronement on the home, and that includes the the, the feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the five for Saturday, uh, the the five, yeah, yes, the five for Saturdays and the nine first Fridays, as we said, devotion of the Holy Ghost. The celebration of the feast of the Sacred Heart today mm-hmm. by the family, um, you know, home gatherings in the uh, in the home in, re- in specific recognition of the Sacred Heart, the daily family rosary before the enthroned image, and there there's a um, the monthly there's adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, but there's also adoration of the image of mm-hmm. our Lord's heart itself, and the, and when you do that, you're fostering those fruits of that devotion within the home, and that's. How we get things back on track? Yes, from all I of think, the mess that we talked about. Yeah, I mean, it's because as you said, there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, just sort of in one of those lines of the liturgy, there's probably you could write a book on it. You know, each one of them. You've gone through that, and you think you did a very, very good job, Trey, with a, with something that was not that was that is not an easy thing to go through in time. But I think you did very well. I, I think that's probably something that people are going to benefit from going back and taking a, a look at that. You know, so more more carefully that. But thank you very much. Yeah, the other thing, uh, Saint Margaret Mary Alico, she wrote to the uh, King of France basically uh, Louis the uh, was it the, the 14th 1689 and said God wants you to consecrate France to the Sacred Heart well he didn't do that 100 years later the French Revolution and his, his son Louis the 15th didn't do it Louis the 16th finally did it his grandson uh, but that was already revolution had broken the out revolution he lost his head started. because yeah. of it you know so when God asks you to do something like this you know there's severe consequence all of France the, the Enlightenment the French mm-hmm. uh, Voltaire and all these characters that dramatically affected the world. Oh, exactly. oh yeah. She, 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 or he, rather, promised 
to defeat all the king's enemies. You know, I mean, think about what was going on at that time. Protestantism, I mean, all of that could have been turned back. Defeating the king's enemies was the enemies of all yes. modern civilization yes, right exactly, now. exactly, exactly, right. Yes. So we're blaming it on the and French. That's why, <laughs> is this, well, is the bottom why, line? Is that what I'm getting That's why, the, you know, if you look at the, like, the, the image of the, the counter-revolution is the Sacred Heart. It's mm -hmm. that red outline of the heart with the cross on top. Yes. That's what the counter-revolutionaries chose the Sacred Heart of all things as yes. their symbol against the Freemasonic. Oh, stuff. the other thing was the, uh, the this reaction, the divine mercy today, you know, the sinfulness of the world. The uh, Sacred Heart devotion in the 1600s was countering this Jansenism. A very rigorous, God is very uh, stern and he's going to, you know, punish you and he doesn't love you. It's very distant relationship with God and to counter that it was the Sacred Heart devotion and God's providence to push back against that. St. John you started and then, and then Margaret Mary Alico with the devotion uh, really pushed back on that. The other thing the Jansenists didn't want to use is you know my, uh, frequent confession, frequent uh, Eucharist and you have the, the uh, nine First Fridays here. Go to confession. Go receive the Blessed Sacrament on this regular basis, you know. Uh, don't uh, don't stay away from the, the source of grace that's going to help you get better. Uh, almost a Pelagian thing with Jansen. Yeah, I'm going to pull mean, myself up my own bootstraps yeah, and God's going to judge always, me if I don't. Yeah, that was a thing. Crazy, that was yeah. a tremendous it's thing. thing I think, you know, that we have these, these heresies never really go away. Um, that they always sort of stick around within the church and there's always individuals who are suffering with these difficulties and, and these heresies today. Maybe you don't have a formal movement of them, but you have that. I think something like the devotion to the Sacred Heart uh, is a wonderful counteracting to something that we I think is prevalent today in Catholicism because it's been a, a reaction to this very, uh, you know, sort of buddy Jesus idea that is prevalent in a lot of Protestant communities. Jesus isn't my king, he's not my lord, he's my friend, he's my brother, he's my buddy. Well, yes and, and, and no, he, you know, and I think there's, there, there is a, not necessarily a middle course, but you have to be able to say, you know, Jesus Christ is my friend, yes, and he does care for me, and he has mercy for me, and he wants to do all these things for me, but also Jesus Christ is my King and my Lord, and I owe him my obedience. And going too far on either one of those, you're, you're going to have a bad time. So that is all that we have time for today. I think we've gone a little bit over, uh, but obviously, as I said to Trey, there's a lot to unpack in the Sacred Heart. If you think about it, this is the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Jesus Christ, he is God. He is truly God and truly man. And he is God who created the universe. By him all things were made. And so his heart, his heart that brims over with love, all the love that made the world, why that must be an infinite love. So we can't possibly hope to do it in a 20 minute show or indeed probably in a, an entire human lifetime. Fortunately, if we are faithful, we will have eternity, eternity to contemplate God face to face and nestle against his sacred heart until, well, until, until forever, I guess. There is no until in eternity. Anyway, but there is an until here and until Monday, we must say goodbye to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Don't forget, this weekend, our Humane Vitae Conference. If you haven't got a ticket and you want to come, still get a ticket. If you don't have a ticket but you want to watch it, it's going to be live streaming all day tomorrow. We're going to have a bunch of talks. Uh, myself, Christine, Michael, Dr. Alan Keyes will be talking. It's going to be really, really good. We're going to be talking about all kinds of things relating to uh, marriage, family life, children, contraception, intimacy, the whole nine yards, all this sort of stuff can be really good. Please join us until then and until Monday if you can't join us. Thanks for tuning in and God bless you.